Um, so honored. It's such a pleasure to have Karen Daniels uh, in this edition of Living Histories. Karen, I am all yours. I want to hear it all. Please take it away. Floor is yours. All right. I have to say, you know, I am so happy to get this invitation. I've been I've been watching these. And like Mandy said, I love sort of the deep history in some of them. So I'll spend more time on that. Um, and also, you know, speaking of things that we feel uncomfortable about, you know, this has mostly been a lot of biophysicists um, who have talked here. And so I'll bring up the role of biophysics uh, at several points. And as some of you may know, I'm not a biophysicist, right? Um, so I'm going to start back in Yorktown, New York in the 1970s. And, you know, I have to say, I was raised by people at IBM Research. And uh, by that, I mean both my mom and dad. Uh, my mom's taking the picture on the left. I'm helping her with a drop spindle while dressed as if it's 1776. Um, my dad's blowing bubbles with me. And both of them, um, uh, prior to my birth, had worked at um, IBM Research in Yorktown. My mom was a research librarian there. Um, and I grew up running the uh, modernist halls of this giant research facility. And all of my parents' friends, um, you know, a number of whom were women, early women scientists, many of whom were not married to their partners, um, including um, single mothers and all sorts of other um, families that weren't so common in the 70s, were very normal um, in my childhood. And these are all people who taught me to ask a lot of questions about the world. Uh, most of them were computer scientists. Some of them were physicists turned computer scientists. Um, but I grew up just around math and science and computers uh, from day one um, and grew up around uh, people who believed in making their own stuff. So my mom's having me learn to spin over there. I knew, knew how to use power tools in that garage at Wright uh, from a very young age. And so it was extremely privileged upbringing for both the reason you know, of the scientists I was around, but also sort of how I was raised to do things for myself. Uh, so from, then we get to the 80s. Oops. Um, and, you know, here's some pictures from the 80s. I'm a little bit more grown up. Um, and, you know, my family was very close. Um, we spent a lot of time having outdoor adventures um, and hiking and skiing and canoeing um, all over the place. Um, and, you know, they very much taught us to be at home in a variety of environments. Um, and to be sort of you know flexible with crazy adventure travel. Um, in the picture at the right, we're actually in France in the Alps. Um, I had just graduated from high school. We'd gotten free tickets from some airline voucher and we were spending a couple of weeks in France. And I discovered that shocker, of all shocking things, the people in France actually spoke French and that the, uh, the high school French I was using um, was incredibly useful for communicating with people. Um, and I think it dawned on me at that moment, you know, that there was a whole world out there if you learned other people's languages um, that you you could communicate in ways that you couldn't otherwise. And so um, that trip was really transformative um, for me and a desire to learn more languages um, as time went on. So this is about career stuff. So we've got some background about me. And then, you know, we need to start doing some career planning. And so this is a little tour through that. Um, so, you know, on the left, um, I'm in a, I, like I said, I grew up at IBM Research. And in that fall uh, for Halloween, we were about to get an IBM PC at home. And I was so excited that I created a costume for Halloween. Um, and that's been a, a force through my life. I've never stopped programming computers from the day that computer entered our house. Um, you know, in the lower left, I skied a lot. Um, by the time I got to high school, we had a very good science program, as you might imagine. Um, in a high school where IBM Research was. This is me in the uh, plant lab in the advanced uh, biology class doing experiments on plants. Um, and then I, you know, I actually loved doing that. I loved plants. I loved the experiments I was doing, but I already sort of knew that I liked the physical sciences more um, and thought I was going to go off to college um, to become an engineer. Um, and this was a few things. One is I'd had the the great fortune of taking a middle school shop class where they taught us the basics of machining uh, and drawing. And I had tried to take some more engineering type classes in high school, but they were actually only in the Votech program at my high school. Um, and so I was discouraged from taking things um, like that. Uh, so when I go off to college, I was thrilled that the college uh, research position I had was happy to let me learn to use things like mills and lathes um, and all of that. And you know, in the lower right, I entertained myself. I played um, some music. I worked on costumes. 
Um, this is me with sort of both aspects of that um, hobby and sitting there. And I came to be a senior and had realized that I had to go on and do something with my life. I was graduating and I needed to figure out my career. And I sort of looked back at what I liked doing um, and grad school wasn't really on the horizon. Um, I had a friend who was ahead of me in college who had gone off to grad school and I thought he was the most brilliant person on the planet, really looked up to him and he'd been miserable in grad school. He'd found it really hard. And I figured if uh, this guy Jim didn't like it, um, it probably wasn't for me either. Um, and this same guy had gone off and decided to teach um, high school instead. And so I said, well, I've taught skiing. Um, <laughs> I've tutored physics. Uh, and I applied to teach uh, high school at a number of private schools who are willing to accept somebody uncredentialed. I had no teaching certificate. Um, and two of the pictures on this page were uh, what got me hired as a physics and math teacher. Again, it ended up being only physics and science in the end and not math. And that is that I played the cello and I'd worked in a costume shop um, because it was an art school and they didn't wanna hire a physics and math teacher who wasn't going to interact well with their students. And so of all the things on the page, my uh, teaching skiing and my arts work was what got me my job. Um, and so you sort of never know, and this has come up in other things today, which pieces of your history are gonna end up mattering. So I loved my job in New York City. I taught science for three years and I mean, at the end of it, um, I was starting to think that there was more science to know in the world and that maybe it was worth uh, going to grad school and checking that out. Um, and a large portion of that, um, I just did it in the wrong order. Um, whoops, ah, sorry about this. Okay, um, was that, you know, I had, trouble finding a research focus, right? And so, you know, by the time I'm making this decision, we're about half, we're about three quarters of the way down this list, right? So on high, I had done a lot of science projects in my life, right? I, in elementary school, I tried to play with Venus tritraps. I'd done some microbiology in middle school. And I showed you the picture of me doing plant genetics, right? When I got to college, the engineering work I was doing was trying to fabricate parts to find high temperature superconductors. As we all know, that didn't work out very well. Um, I'd done an internship, um, doing some translation from French to English um, about math articles. Um, I had spent an REU tracking near Earth asteroids. I had done a research project <laughs> on plasma physics. And you can see that these have almost nothing in common. <laughs> um, and so I had arrived at the point at the end of my BA where I, grad school didn't look that appealing. I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. Okay. Um, but the fact was that uh, somewhere along uh, that um, route, while I was working in as a teacher, uh, I met this guy over here, actual biologist Todd Vision, um, and he was a grad student. And I loved hanging out with all of him and his professors um, and said, you know what, I should just go to grad school and, and I've got questions and I should try it out. And I was thrilled to be, work in the lab of hard Bowden shots at Cornell. This is me working on a gas convection apparatus. Um, and he was a terrific mentor that's come up before. And I got to study uh, chaos and nonlinear dynamics and which made beautiful patterns, um, some of which I'll, I'll show you again on the next page. And it was an absolutely wonderful PhD. Um, so at the end of that time, you need to make a question of how, as, as Lisa said, you need to figure out how to stay with uh, the person you love. Um, and by that point, um, my partner had moved to North Carolina um, and started a faculty position at UNC. Um, and so I had to pick a postdoc, which was either a postdoc of my choice scientifically um, or a postdoc with uh, somebody very conveniently located. Um, and I am extremely grateful that I decided to join Bob Berenger's lab and that's him in the lower left. And this is my going away party from his lab. Um, and you know, he was also an incredibly supportive member um, of my you know, education and getting me uh, going towards things. And then of course, at some point you need to figure out what to do next. Um, and, you know, again, the question is, do you try to stay, you know, where you are and you have someone um, already as a partner in your life or do you try to take a job someplace else? Um, and we considered both options. Um, and at the time I was divided. I didn't know if I wanted to take a job where I was um, as my original plan was to be at a small liberal arts college with a real focus on undergraduate research um, or to get a job at a big research university. And I honestly wasn't convinced. You know, I had gone to grad school, you know, as a teacher um, and I still identified very much as that person. 
um, and was still not totally confident that I was a researcher, you know, who should take a job at an R1 university. Um, and every single person on this page said, yes, you should do that. Um, I filled out the applications. I sent them in. They wanted to talk to me. I said, okay. <laughs> um, and I went on my interviews and it literally wasn't until I'd been on interviews and tried to explain to people why they might want to hire me as a, as a faculty member to run a research lab that I realized that all of the research that I'd been thinking about doing and had written about in my uh, um, job applications and had dreamed about building a lab to do was actually what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, and that the taking a job at NC State was absolutely the right decision. And this is where it gets a little funny because they actually were looking to hire a biophysicist. And I was advised um, that maybe I should cast myself as a biophysicist, right? Um, and explain how what I could do, you know, with nonlinear dynamics and fractals and all sorts of cool things, you know, might actually have something to do with biophysics. Um, and I completely ignored that advice. Um, I proposed to NC State that I wanted to work on granular materials and a bit on fluids. Um, and it wasn't what they were looking for. And uh, you know, I am forever grateful that they decided to hire me um, and allow me to do what I'm going to do. So the pictures um, on the bottom here are all from stuff I've done since NC State. And I want to point out a couple of things, which is that they all have pieces that this three quarters of my life where I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, so I did actually end up doing microbiology, you know, not myself. This is a collaboration with Beth Shank, who was at UNC at the time. Um, and um, her students and my students got together and we did some rheology of biofilms. And I returned to my middle school growing things on agar days. Um, you know, all of the stuff I learned about fabricating arms, about calculating fractals, about particle tracking, <laughs> I now call it particle tracking, time I just saw on asteroids, right? Integrating these, everything I'd done in here ended up being a big part of the skills I needed to do the stuff I wanted to do when I finally had my own questions um, that I wanted asking. Um, and that was unexpected um, that, you know, it looks like everything made sense in the end and looks like everything was connected and who knows if that's causal uh, or not. Um, some other cool things that happened along the way because you need to take opportunities as they arise is at, while I was finishing up my postdoc, I saw an ad saying you could apply to be part of the IUPAP team to go to the International Women in Physics Conference in Rio de Janeiro that summer. Um, and so I joined, this is me down here, I joined a part of that delegation. Um, yeah, and on the, oh, I need to, I'll, I'll finish it. Yeah, <laughs> unknown to me, this is actually a merge of two delegations. There was a very white delegation um, and it was merged with one that had formed alternatively to make one whole team. And many of us didn't know that until we got there or after. I learned so much from all of the women around the world, all the women on my team, um, about what we all, all of our experiences were and how different they were um, and, you know, how we could work to make it a better place for all of us. And so I'm incredibly grateful for that opportunity. Um, I'll skip the sabbatical and getting in and I'll just say that I think my take home message and these are all, most of these are pictures from the last few years, um, is that people do science, right? And those people show up with a whole host of experiences, right? And interests and loves. And, you know, mine is that things make cool patterns and shows up there and again. Um, I'm grateful to have been part of teams of researchers where my stand partner is a research collaborator, where old postdocs come back to watch prior undergrads defend their thesis on Zoom. And one of them was there at one in the morning, his time, where my next door neighbor and I knit patterns and talk about where curvature comes from, right? Where, you know, my student uh, Farnaz recently graduated. She came halfway around the world. Um, and, you know, my lab now has ended up back in the field with the stuff I started with growing up, um, which was playing outdoors. And that's my lab group out um, doing our some of our first um, field studies. Um, and so I will close there. Uh, wow. Thank you so much, Karen. So much food for thought. Um, I, let me ask you a question while others are gathering their thoughts, uh, which is, I, I keep coming back to how many recurring themes there were in your talk, which did not seem intuitive at all initially, but seemed obvious at the end of the talk. Um, and in that context, I wonder if you think research themes uh, based on our living histories is uh, better pursued than research 
for Sai. Uh, <laughs> you know, so many of us have diffuse uh, interests and they show up in different ways in, our, in what we like to do. So your thoughts on people feeling force-fitted into a research focus? Yeah, I hate boxes. <laughs> um, you know, the I don't think I really found my footing as a scientist until I really decided to study things that I am interested in, right? And that the people in my lab should study things they're interested <laughs> in. And, you know, they might use my projects as training, right? If they're less interested in my projects, because that's what the funding you know stream currently is, right? But that the projects that they do end up being more interesting when they are what they're interested in. <laughs> and I think, that, and it's more fun for everybody. And I think this really struck me when I submitted my, I think it was when I was submitting my, it was either my tenure packet or my promotion packet. And I looked at which of the projects I liked most, which I won't reveal what they are. Um, and they were all things that were not what the grant was exactly supposed to be doing. <laughs> like the, the projects I was most proud of were things that were 35 <laughs> to 75 degrees off. <laughs> Um, and I think this is why the NSF is great is because they fund people to do science. And if you're a little bit, you know, is it the science evolves, you know, it, it, things go with it. And I really appreciate, I really appreciate intellectual, intellectual freedom to be creative in directions that are interesting. Wow. Thank you so much on that inspiring note. I'm closing the recording. <laughs>